Now, one of the things that comes out of it seems to me the way you've thought about these problems that in your training as an economist is that people aren't going to be passive with regard to policies that, yeah. you know, you, you, you set a policy in place, you have to worry about how people are going to re respond to that policy. You might say, well, given how they've behaved in the past, this would be a fantastic policy, yeah. but of course they're going to behave a very different way once that policy is in place. Right. Is that something that we should be thinking heavily about when we think about policies? Part of the virtues of relatively simple and transparent approaches is that provided you can commit to them, which is an issue in its own right, that that, that, that can limit the type of uncertainty the private sector has to face. And, and, and it also can also limit the amount of what I think of as, as potentially counterproductive activity trying to game the rules and figure out ways around you know, uh, some potentially complex rules and you know, what's the right workaround and the like, I, which, which I think socially is unproductive activity. Um, so I do think that more explicit Simpl uh, transparency can can really, in the end, make sound economic policies work better and work better at an earlier point in time. Well, let me try to tie this back to a couple of historical policy prescriptions and, and then try to bring it into some of the issues that are on the table today. So Friedman's solution to this was a simple monetary rule. And let's not try to manipulate the money supply to guide the economy, let's just adopt a simple constant growth rule or something like that. Yeah. We're going to grow the money supply at a, you know, roughly the rate of growth of the economy or something like that and, and just and, and say we're going to do that co no matter what. Yeah. Um, sort of the Taylor rule that people have heard a lot about kind of picks up on that idea, focuses on interest rates as opposed to quantities, right. but still nonetheless sort of says we're going to have a target and we're going to stick to it. Right. And again, this gets to your notion of commitment. Those issues are still on the table, but the biggest ones probably on the table today uh, are things like bank regulation yeah. and things like that. And yes. you know, how do we apply these principles not to monetary growth or to the Fed setting interest rate policy? Yeah. How do we set these policies with regard to bank regulation? Yeah. So you have some thoughts on that, yeah. I'm sure. Sure. So there's multiple dimensions to this. One is if we think about asking our regulators to go in and l closely monitor the behavior of large-scale financial institutions, you know, the, the, the Chase, the Citibanks, and the like, that just seems to me like a, a horrendous regulatory challenge and have some type of micro view of those, you know, exactly their risk positions and, and, and their behavior, to, kind of, to try to micromanage that behavior just seems to me to be pretty much a hopeless task and one that would be a mistake for us to put on the shoulders of uh, regulators. They're just not, not going to have the expertise or the ability to do that in a particularly great way. One can debate whether the banks themselves do a good job of it, but it would be very, very difficult for external examiners to do that well. For reasons like that, I think, you know, Putting more simplified kind of capital requirements on, on, on banks is a more sensible way to go. Um, even there, you have to start worrying about complexity issues because when we were uh, uh, for um, un under the various different Basel agreements, we we started lapsing into various different attesting risk weights to different forms of bank capital. It turns out that for a while, um, sovereign. Sovereign, uh, sovereign debt had uh, zero risk, risk attached to it, which for certain countries that seemed, didn't seem to be a particularly wise choice of numbers there. Um, Italian so sovereign well. debt has no risk. Is that kind Greek, of the idea? Greek, yeah, kind of Greek, Greek as well. <laughs> Greek, Greek <is> sovereign <laughs> no, debt has no, no risk. So, so you know, you know, even that form of complexity can, get you, can, can, possibly, get, uh, can possibly get you into trouble. But I think thinking through more, uh, more simplified approaches like that, um, uh, uh, I would find much more I'd, I'd be much more, uh, much more receptive to those. Is there market-based evidence we could use to help us do this? I mean, you talked yeah. earlier about, you know, financial information runs both ways. Is yeah. there market-based information that we could use to try to help us? 
yeah. assess bank capital in a more sensible way? There's some interesting work that's been done, and, and, and it's not terribly surprising. Sometimes we rely on banks' own models to do these risk assessments and banks' own models to figure out what are sensible prices. Of course, that can be dangerous too. And, and in fact, there's some evidence, not surprisingly, that when you rely on banks' models, they understate the uh, uh, default probabilities relative to uh, external assessments and the like. The other challenge here is if when they go in to regulate a financial sector, what part do we really want to regulate? Right now, part of Dodd-Frank is we designate systemically important financial institutions, these so-called SIFIs. And the rules for what, what's a SIFI are not entirely clear here. And what it means to have that designation is also not so clear. Once you have that designation, you're, you're, you're certainly going to be um, asked to be responsive to more oversight and regulation. So the fin financial institutions aren't, aren't going to like it for that reason. On the other hand, but the other question that arises is, is what happens in the next big crisis? Are, are, is there some type of implicit insurance provided by the government that if these institutions get in trouble, indeed they will be bailed out? Now, there's claims that that isn't the case, and, and, and that's not part of the designation, um, and, and the whole point of the regulation is to try to avoid that, but I think we w won't know that until we see the next financial crisis and how it plays out. So there's an element of uncertainty there over how the policy is going to be oh, implemented. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And also there's this danger that once you kind of put implicit, uh, the, the implicit possibility of government bailouts that you remove a very important part of market discipline. What makes people behave well is the threat of failure. And um, uh, now sometimes people don't fail because of bad management and, and the like, but, some, but the threat of failure helps to put incentives in place for people to behave better. Because once you start removing the market punishments, you're not letting markets do what they're supposed to do. And, and, and that kind of works against things. If we're going to play this game of kind of intervening in markets, I think we have to do it in a very, very careful way. And there's debates now about what piece of the financial sector do you really regulate? We know a lot of activities have gone into so-called shadow banking sectors from what used to be bank activities. Uh, do we extend regulations to the entire financial sector, engage in all these shadow banking type ac shadow banking activities? That I I personally would prefer to see us draw things much more narrowly, and to, but to draw it narrowly means that once they're outside this realm of regulation, that you have to let them fail. That, so you're that, saying when, when they miss, which, when things go badly, you have to let markets do their thing. So let me let me just talk about that for a minute. So if we have a regulated sector, and maybe they're re, and a shadow banking develops. Yes. Do you see shadow banking as? A, a warning sign, or do you see it as well? That's that's a market alternative, and yeah. but make clear that the shadow banking is outside my regulated sphere, which means I maybe don't control it as much as I otherwise would, yes. but I don't feel responsible for it as much as I otherwise would. Is that is that yes. kind of what you're saying? Yes, but you have to draw those boundaries clearly. Clearly, so yes. this gets back again to the transparency. Absolutely. We have to agree. So one thing you're saying is, whatever, however we draw the boundaries, let's make it clear. Clear, absolutely. This activity's in, this activity's out, that's it. Yeah. And is it okay to have the same activity being done by different entities, some inside the regulated sector and some in the shadow banking or outside the regulated sector? So they, they compete against one another, is that? Okay, or is that a ding? Is that there may be certain activities which you want to go to the shadow banking sector, but then participants will have to understand that that's not an activity that's going to be propped up by the government if, if things go badly, and they're not going to be given governmental guarantees and insurances for for for, uh, for behavior outside there. And so I think you would have to let the kind of um, internal workings of the financial system sort out which, um, which activities are going to be occurring in which type of sectors. And there be, might be some activities that are in both. And, yeah, the some, could be some the, co yeah, yeah, coexist in both, yes. You could have uh, the regulated version yeah. of activity yes. A and the unregulated yeah. version. So I, and, yeah, and people could decide which ones to participate in. Maybe they participate in both, maybe one or the other. So I could have a savings account that's in the non- yes banking right. sector, it's not guaranteed by the government. Yep. Maybe there's some private guarantee organization that yes. tries to do that, yes. but it's explicitly outside. This is a non-government right. backed product. And yeah. then I have a guaranteed savings institu yeah. institution. Yes. And they might pay different interest rates, yeah. Yeah. but they nonetheless would compete against one another. Yes. I guess I'm just trying to make sure we understand that. And then there's some activities that would be reserved for the 
would we reserve and say you know, only regulated people can offer these activities? If it's going to provide deposit insurance, yes, only regulated activities can provide that. So let me get outside finance just for yeah. a minute. So this is like, let's say we're talking delivery services. Yeah. We have the U.S. Post Office yes. who does first class mail and packages and stuff like that. And we have FedEx and UPS and those guys who are, well, we would be the un, the, that does package delivery, but they're not allowed to do first class mail. They're, they're, they're explicitly prohibited. Now, some people could accuse them of doing first class mail. Yeah. Or, so the finance world would kind of look like that. Yeah. Um, and if the regulated sector can't keep pace, it'll lose out right. to the private outside the banking sector. But and we're going to leave it up to consumers and then to make their choices yes. across these sectors. And they'll have to choose whether yeah. they use one and or the other. Part of the government policy has to be transparency, making it clear to all participants what the, what the rules of the game are here. Got gotcha. you. So it's the participants, when you say all the participants, you mean the, the guys running the outfits yes. that you know, you've chosen to be outside yes. and you've chosen to be inside, here are the rules. Right. And then the, the buyers of those services also have to understand who yes. they're buying from. Absolutely. And you talked a bit about, about commitment. Yeah. And in this context, commitment means, well, a bunch of people bought these unguaranteed outside assets. Yeah. The world goes downhill. We they can't say, out. well, geez, you know, that's not fair to them. Right. They didn't really understand things or something. We, we have to make sure the information's out there for them to under, potentially understand, but you know. And, and you say, well, geez, well, given that things went against them, why don't we bail them out? What, what's the danger in saying? The danger in bailing them out today is activity in the future. Because when you try to, you could say, well, I'm just gonna do this one time. But then, but then, but then when you say, I'm, I'm never gonna do it again, who's gonna believe you? Yes, I, I absolutely, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> Why should they believe you? But, but, you know, that's, that, that's a but that's a temptation, thing. I know. There's a temptation to say, well, geez, God, don't we feel bad and yeah. don't we feel like we... I, I understand. It's a huge, yeah, that, that, that commitment is really hard to enforce and, and hard to abide by. After the fact, you have to be willing to say there's a value yeah. in sticking to yeah. my simple, yeah. transparent rule but all that simplicity and transparency isn't worth very much if it's not a rule. Yeah, yeah, right. Now, one can say in maybe very, very extreme circumstances of something fully unanticipated that maybe we should back off this a little bit. Uh, and that might be the case. Maybe discretion is important in, in, in some very, very extreme circumstances. But whenever you exercise it, you have to understand there's cost down the road in doing so. People may have expectations of you doing it in the future. But that's something I hear you saying about policy very generally, that Whenever you think about setting policy, you can't view it as a case by policy in, by its, in its very nature is not case by case. Yeah. Policy is something that spans, again, this gets back to your uncertainty point right. about everything else, yeah. that it's sort of policy you have to realize, I, whenever I make a policy decision, I'm not just dealing with a specific case because I'm going to affect right the behavior and if in one thing is I could people are going to react directly to that the other thing is they're going to realize that I didn't mean what I said right. I, I set a policy but yeah. eh, you know yeah. boys will be boys I'll change my ideas right so you're kind of pointing out the danger in following that kind of case by case yes. after the fact where's an area where you think we've done pretty well do you think monetary policy you know, economists have been talking about monetary policy for a long time. You think yeah. we've gotten better? I'm not saying we're where we are, where we want to be, but have we gotten yeah. better? So monetary policy, going up to the financial crisis, was was looking like we should, it was pretty much stabilized. My own view is through the financial crisis. In many respects, we looked at monetary policy almost as if this was supposed to fix everything, and almost as if we're asking it to do too much. And there's a sense in which 
pretty early on monetary policy on its own kind of ran out of gas, gas in, term, in terms of what it could do. Now we started talking about, well, we hit the zero interest rate bound. We were we talked about forward guidance, which ended up being somewhat of a joke. But now, why was forward guidance a joke? Tell, let's, uh, that's okay. a great example, <laughs> because I think it fits into some of what you're talking about. So, okay. why, so what, what is guidance. forward guidance and why? So is forward it guidance was, uh, in the academic literature, was this notion that, well, okay, we're sitting here at a zero lower bound, so moving interest rates today can't do very much for us. The only thing we can do is we can announce very clearly in the future the, a course of action that can influence behavior today and spell it out very, very clearly. Under the, these sets of circumstances, this is what we will do. And that was the nature of forward guidance. We make it clear what our course will be in the future, but it's not that easy to implement it. And when the Fed tr started trying to spell out the set of circumstances in which they would move out of the zero lower bound, it be things became very, very muddled because they didn't really want to fully commit to it because they want the flexibility to look at a variety of different indicators and barometers and were never very, they were always kind of fuzzy when the ch on, under what set of circumstances they were going to pull their way out of it. Okay, so let me let me try to score this one on the Hanson scorecard. I mean, yeah. I've given you a scorecard. So. <laughs> yeah. On the Hansen scorecard, this gets a pretty high score for transparency because it's an effort to try to be transparent. Let me, yeah. I, I realize I'm taking <laughs> some liberties there, but it, you could motivate this yes. as let's be more transparent yes. about what our policy is. Yeah. We're not just going to tell you what we're doing today. We're going to go so far as to tell you, okay. Right. So on that element of the Hansen four parameter scorecard, it gets, it gets high. I'll call it high marks. Yeah. You might disagree with me, but I'll, I, let me score for now. <laughs> I'm going to give it high marks. On the Hansen, keep it simple, yeah. pretty low marks on yeah. that, on that right. dimension. Yeah. And probably <laughs> on the Hansen, let's not create uncertainty, <laughs> no, probably not doing so well either. Right. Right. And on the Hansen, it's got to be something you can commit to, yeah. not so good there. Right. So maybe he now, gets one yeah. A minus and a bunch of Ds. <laughs> I mean, is that kind of the lower well, well, grades? Yes. Now the thing is, in many respects, I was not so worried about this, just because I thought the monetary policy itself was not the potent lever anymore. So the cost of this type of activity was, on the other hand, probably not terribly enormous either. In some sense, it seemed to me the bigger the bigger challenges were regulating the uh, financial institutions in ways that can nurture the creation of new enterprises, nurture the creation of new job growth and the like, and how will we address our long-term fiscal challenges. Uh, you know, throughout the financial crisis, we kept on arguing, well, what, well we, we just postpone them now and not think about them now and just roll them over, but at, but at what point in time we stop rolling them over and face up to them? And those, those so are the policy levers. When you say fiscal levers. challenges, two real elements of that. One is because we've been rolling it over, we've accumulated a yes. pretty a large amount of debt. Yes. And number two, we have all these anticipated liabilities relative to at least on the books future taxes yes. that seem to fall short. So we, we, yes. we're kind of in debt yeah. with the prospect of not yeah, paying it yeah. off very quickly. Or so the federal government faces down. this to some extent. Of course, the state of Illinois faces this in a dramatic way right now. So when you say fiscal issues, yes. you're referring to both the accumulated debt yes. position and the forward-looking, yes. call it tax versus right. revenue, you know, spending versus tax picture. Yeah, absolutely. Especially the latter one, maybe that politically hard, most challenging one to address. But I, mean, but I view those issues as almost very important. Of course, fiscal and monetary policy have have never been distinct. They're interconnected. They're, 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 that interplay is often uh, really critical. And discussions of monetary policy too often probably le you know, leave out that somehow monetary policy is not operating in a vacuum. <laughs>